everybody. Good afternoon and welcome once again to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm Lorna Virgili, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government. And joining us today is Dr. James Bridgers, Acting Health Officer, as well as Assistant, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, Dr. Earl Stoddard, Mr. Sean O'Donnell, Program Administrator, Public Health, Emergency Preparedness and Response for the Department of Health and Human Services. And we have a special guest today, Dr. Lou Damiano, who is the President Holy Cross Health Acute Care. Members of the media, remember to use the chat during the Q&A portion of this presentation. And with that, good afternoon to you, Mr. County Executive. Thank you all for joining us again this week. And uh, I want to start by recognizing uh, today is National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. Uh, it was the air attack by Japanese forces on Hawaii that killed more than 2,400 people. And as President Franklin Roosevelt said famously, it's a day that will live in infamy. And we continue to remember that day. The next day, the United States entered World War II, which changed the course of world history. Every year that passes, there are fewer and fewer people who are still alive who remember the horror of that day. And we have fewer firsthand testimonies from that time. It's important to look back and remember his history and the lives lost and the impact that Pearl Harbor had on this nation and on the world. Um, today, I, uh, before I came over here, I was over uh, greeting Santa. This is our county's first responders. Uh, they, they don't often have to work the holidays, but they're also giving back this season. Um, I just wrapped up a visit with Santa and the Montgomery County Police Department motor officers. They've been helping out with Santa's visit to Children's Inn at the National Institutes of Health for 15 years now. And the Children's Inn at NIH serves over 650 families that receive world-class clinical treatment to give kids a chance to overcome life-threatening illnesses. And it's one of the gems that we have in Montgomery County than the NIH has put together. Uh, this year, MCPD stopped in Rockville to check out the Christmas tree and skating rink after spending most of the day shopping for children who can't return home this holiday. And our police department's outreach represents the efforts of many of our county departments and employees uh, in giving back to our residents, community, and neighborhoods during the holiday season and around the year. And our county employees' holiday giving campaign is in full swing with two weeks left to reach our goal this year of $300,000. I also encourage all the residents to consider donating their time and money to our local charities. Our local charities serve people in need and uh, COVID has certainly heightened the need in our community now, even as COVID, COVID as, um, as an illness has lessened somewhat from the worst of it. Um, many people are still not working, jobs haven't fully returned. Uh, people are dealing with soaring rents and uh, the need to, um, the needs out there are great, and anything you can do to help would be greatly appreciated. Um, our hospitals continue to see elevated patient levels driven by this tridemic of RSV, flu, and COVID-19. And as you can see from these graphs, our hospital emergency department visits are higher than at any time since, uh, since the same time last year, and as high as the peaks of the first Omicron wave. Uh, flu cases have risen sharply since Thanksgiving, and it's not surprising given how the holiday brings together people who don't normally see each other. But this year, flu is spiking much earlier and higher than in recent years, just as RSV arrived earlier than expected in September. So these three things have come together to create um, an especially uh, dangerous mix. And uh, these and other respiratory illnesses are in danger of putting our hospitals in a very bad position. So I wanted to bring on Dr. Louis Damiano, president of Holy Cross Health Acute Care in, in the Maryland region to talk a little bit more about the impacts that they're seeing right now in our hospitals and especially in the emergency rooms. I wanna say this, this is important because we want people to realize how important it is to do what you need to do to knock down the likelihood of you're getting affected by um, COVID or the flu or RSV because the repercussions on you can lead to repercussions in the broader healthcare system. So please think about that and I'll welcome uh, Dr. Damiano now. 
Okay, so thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and I wanna thank the county executive for inviting me. So I wanna take uh, some time uh, this afternoon to describe what we're seeing in the emergency departments and the hospitals at Holy Cross Silver Spring and Holy Cross Germantown Hospital. As the county executive showed you a little bit earlier in uh, the presentation, we have had uh, a marked increase in the number of um, um, RSV patients and flu patients that we're seeing in the emergency department. And let's not forget COVID. So we term this the triple-demic because of the three different upper respiratory tract environments. They present very similarly with colds, um, with sneezing, uh, coughing, congestion, fever, fatigue, and malaise. And so they're very similar in their presentation, but as they, they affect different populations differently. RSV is primarily um, targeting the pediatric population, the younger kids, kids under the age of two. It also impacts uh, the elderly as well. Flu is mostly in the age range from five to 24, although it will impact all ages and COVID impacts all ages as well. As we're seeing in the emergency department, we're seeing a big increase in the number of pediatric patients that are presenting to both Silver Spring and Germantown. Many of these kids will present with all the upper respiratory tract um, um, symptoms that I just described. And some of them will also start to describe issues with wheezing, difficulty breathing, changes in skin color, nausea, vomiting, and they're really, sometimes they can be fairly sick. As we see them in the emergency department and we evaluate these kids, we try and triage them into ones that can be discharged home to the care of their parents or that they need to be admitted. Recently in Silver Spring, in the last four to five months, we've seen roughly between both hospitals about 500 visits a month uh, for upper respiratory tract infections. In the month of July and August, most of those upper respiratory tract infections uh, were due to COVID. In the last couple of months, that has changed. So now about 50% of the visits that we see in both Silver Spring and Germantown for upper respiratory tract infections are either RSV or their flu. So the composition of the upper respiratory tract infections has really changed in the last couple of months. The impact on the emergency room is that the volumes are higher. And as the volumes are higher and we try and see and treat and triage the patients, it also um, uh, results in longer wait times. Holy Cross, Silver Spring and Holy Cross Germantown hospitals have a big women and infant service. We do not have pediatric ICUs. So any of the children that have lower respiratory tract infections or bronchiolitis that require extra oxygen and need to stay overnight, we have the ability to accommodate some of them, but we do not have a pediatric ICU. Those patients are stabilized in the emergency department and they are transferred to other pediatric hospitals that have pediatric ICUs. Those hospitals, um, Children's National Hospital, uh, University of Maryland, Johns Hopkins, LifeBridge are all at and above capacity. So we have to stabilize, treat these kids, wait for transport in order to get them into the pediatric ICUs. It stresses our staffing, it stresses our resources, it stresses the amount of uh, time that you have to wait. We continue to see all of the other uh, common um, day-to-day -day things that we see in the emergency room on top of this. So my, my recommendation is that as we go through this triple endemic and you have a child or you have an upper respiratory tract infection and you have all the common signs and symptoms of a cold, fever, malaise, runny nose, and a cough, Contact your primary care provider or your pediatrician uh, for advice. If you don't feel that it is severe, please go to an acute care facility. If you have any question, uh, I'm sorry, to an urgent care facility, if you have any question whatsoever that it might be severe and that your child is not doing well, then please come to the nearest emergency room. So with that, I'm open to take any questions that you might have 
about what we're seeing with RSV, flu, and COVID in the emergency departments. Thank you, Dr. Damiano and Mr. County Executive. Members of the media, uh, this is a time where we open it up for questions and answers for either Dr. Damiano or the County Executive. So uh, please use the chat, identify the organization you represent, work for, and uh, let us know if you have any questions. We'll give you a minute or two. Second, not minute. <laughs> I see Steve. There you go, Steve Bonnell. Good afternoon, but that's the beat. I, I guess um, Lou can feel this first. Just a broad question versus the last six months to now, how serious is the situation you now? I'm seeing COVID still being manageable, uh, but as you mentioned, a lot more RSV and flu cases coming in. Um, just how serious is this? And you mentioned your staff, obviously, having to deal with all this. Just take me through that, I guess, for all to start off. Yeah, sure. I mean, the triple pandemic is extremely serious. Um, you know, the COVID pandemic, we had surges between 20 and 22, and the most recent one was with Omicron. And with the Omicron surge in January, um, the hospital resources were really uh, fairly well stressed. I mean, there were a lot of patients during Omicron. Um, not only did it affect our community, community, it also affected our staff. So as we kind of came through January and started to move throughout the year, the COVID pandemic kind of tailed off, didn't go away. During the summer, it felt like it spiked just a little bit more. We were seeing an increased number of COVID patients. So the EDs were relatively full and we had a fair number of inpatient admissions as a result of COVID. Then in August and in September, we got these big spikes in RSV and flu. And that's when we started to see a real increase in the number of kids in the emergency department. Fortunately, most of those kids can be seen, triaged, treated, and um, their disposition is to go home and follow up with their pediatrician. A few of them we had to admit for overnight uh, because they either had signs and symptoms of pneumonia or they were dehydrated and we needed to take care of them. Others that are uh, required uh, pediatric intensive care, we stabilized and sent to pediatric ICUs. So in the emergency department now, I, I would say that a good, um, about a good third of the volume that we see on a day-to-day -day basis either happens to be COVID, um, flu, or RSV. So it is, it is a very significant number of patients coming in and presenting with one of those three. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, between the month of July and the month of November, there's been a, a, a marked decrease in the number of patients coming through the ED with COVID but it's been offset by an increase in the number of patients coming in with influenza or RSV. And most of the influenza is influenza A. And any of the health officials can kind of feel this, and I apologize, it's already been touched on, but especially for RSV and influenza, what's causing that increase in recent months? And especially in kids, as you highlight, I'm wondering if you've seen anything or are trying to figure that out. Um, Cause obviously protecting Never wants to protect their kids. I'm just curious what, what we might be seeing here. I don't know if Dr. Bridges wants to start. I certainly can. I mean, I, I certainly, I mean, I think there is a component of this where we did not see a ton of non COVID respiratory illness in previous years. And so you're, you know, you have a little bit more of a, uh, I won't say naive population, but it's a little less recently exposed. And, and, and frankly, we just see during this time of year, this is a, this is a, 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 it's not unusual to see uh, surges in respiratory illnesses around this time of year. It's just obviously with, um, you know, fewer masks being utilized and fewer, um, you know, people not necessarily uh, strictly adhering to those non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs, as they have in previous years, you're just going to see a bit of a spike. And then you layer on top of that COVID-19 and, oh, by the way, so a lot of the ED boarding of behavioral health patients, you end up with these real challenges for the emergency departments when you combine all of these things together uh, in ways that uh, you know are tough to anticipate. 
I don't know if Dr. Bridgers wants to sure. add that. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Steve, just to add to that, you know, what we saw earlier in the, let me just back up a bit. So our team anticipated that we would have um, higher numbers of, potentially higher numbers of COVID and influenza-like illnesses in the fall. We didn't anticipate on RSV uh, hitting us uh, sooner uh, uh, as opposed to later uh, as the numbers and, and Mr. O'Donnell will illustrate in, in, in part of uh, our update this morning, but folks are out more as uh, Dr. Stoddard indicated, folks uh, have gotten away or did get away perhaps from those public health practices that we prided ourselves uh, over the last two and a half years, hand washing, you know, covering their coughs, which sneezes most. Most children were returning back to school after a couple of years of hybrid uh, classroom, virtual learning, in-class experiences. So we saw a lot of socialization in our community. S consequently, we see these uh, upper respiratory illnesses as Dr. Diamano uh, articulated in his update, but also those, the stressors last year, uh, as, as we saw Omicron, we saw the healthcare system stress with a new variant. We didn't have a bivalent vaccine out there and some folks um, let their guards down per se. Now we are experiencing this as we get into the respiratory illness season. And so we continue to monitor um, all three tridemic or viruses um, that we are talking about now. The challenge is to separate, in some instances, we see COVID increasing and decreasing or having wavelets. We saw an earlier onset of RSV. Uh, last year, we didn't have that hot, uh, Washington uh, Hospital Center, well, uh, Children's Hospital, I should say, was overwhelmed. We didn't see that in our stressors. Um, our hospital systems treated the acute care, and uh, we followed up if there are any community challenges with our uh, hospital partners. This year, we are segmenting or compartmentalizing all three viruses to make sure that we continue with our preventative strategies, our education, and our outreach. And so this is how we are responding. Last week or a couple of weeks ago, I called it our trifecta approach in response to the tridemic. So these are the things that we're seeing in the community now and following up and continue to monitor. And I guess my last question is kind of, the county officials can feel this, just assisting the hospitals as they start to see more people. And obviously individuals can take their own actions as, as I've outlined, but just what, and you kind of hinted at this already, Dr. Bridgers, but what is the county kind of doing to assist hospitals, hopefully, to help them get through this winter? I guess as simple as that sounds. So one of the one of the things that we're doing, uh, Steve, is having this conversation with the representative from our hospital system. We have ongoing conversations. Uh, Mr. O'Donnell, his team, we review weekly essence data from our hospital systems. Our emergency department visits. We uh, increase the frequency of calls and collaborations uh, with our hospital uh, partners just to assess where we are, be it ICU challenges, acute care challenges, emergency department challenges. We look at resources. We look at last year, there was a challenge with um, our clinical staff, nurses. And so we work with our partners to look at what type of resources we could help uh, provide either through our um, uh, our, our clinics, our community, uh, other community providers, but also we looked at our urgent care uh, settings as well because they were impacted and our pharmacy systems were impacted. So we continue to work and see how we can manage uh, the response to keep the community safe. A couple things I wanna to add too. So obviously there's uh, robust vaccination opportunities that may not prevent you from getting the illness, flu or, or COVID, but it certainly would improves the likelihood that you will not have a severe enough case that would warrant hospitalization. And so obviously that helps keep the pressure off the uh, emergency departments. Uh, we, the, count, the county executive did propose and the county executive did pass a $10 million supplemental for the hospital systems as well, recognizing the, the staffing surge, you know, that they've had to, uh, you know, pay, essentially pay for during the last several months. And that should help provide them some additional resources as we go through these more difficult months. But also I think, and, and Dr. Breeders hit on this, is a lot of this is, is, is public education about um, how you protect yourself uh, through vaccination, when you should seek a hospital care. You should never, if you're looking for routine testing, the county provides that. You should not be using an emergency department for routine testing for for for, uh, for an illness. And so that's a good example of something where we need to educate the public about the other opportunities that we're providing through our clinics, through our rapid take-home tests, the PCR tests that we have at our libraries and rec centers, all those things that we have ongoing uh, afford uh, 
people resources that should reduce the people going to the EDs to only those who, who really need it. And that's what Dr. Damiano was referring to is really the EDs are reserved for those patients who uh, need that, uh, that, that acute care because, uh, you know, we need to keep the beds available. Um, it may not just be you you're protecting by getting vaccinated or following those other instructions. It may be a loved one who experiences a heart attack or a car accident who faces the, 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 the challenges of, of ED bed availability when they seek care. I know council, you know, uh, outgoing council uh, member Rice uh, poignantly described these challenges he had last year with his mother when she had, had an illness and the challenges they faced during the Omicron surge. And so we've got some real examples in the county of this having been a challenge and we're trying to uh, avert it from getting to that level moving forward. The other thing I will also know, and this is a more long-term issue, um, I, we know that mental and behavioral health patients are, are, are ED boarding, and so we're attempting, the county executive has proposed a restoration center. We believe that that would help uh, defray some of the patients that are spending a lot of time in the emergency departments waiting for placements in uh, mental health uh, treatment facilities. And so that's an example of another activity the county is really engaged in to try and help the, the, the emergency departments out over the medium term. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we continue on this topic. More questions for Dr. Damiano. Kevin Lewis, ABC7. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, is the county aware of any deaths in relation to, in regards to RSV um, or the flu? And if so, um, can you contextualize that a bit? I'm sorry, was that a question for me? So we've had, um, um, we've been very fortunate in terms of treating our patients with RSV that uh, we have not had any uh, deaths as a result of that. In terms of the flu, um, I can't recall what that number is, but it would be extremely low if we've had any, and it would be adults. And I don't know if anyone from the county has a 40,000 foot overview of the other hospitals and fire rescue things of that nature? Uh, yes, Kevin, I'm, I'm going to try to pull up uh, the deaths. I know they've been low um, statewide, and that may be the only number I can give you is the statewide number of deaths. Um, one thing that we're concerned about um, is it, it's largely uh, a disease that impacts young children. Um, and uh, the most vulnerable are, of course, those children who are under one years of age. Um, uh, again, because they're least able to identify how sick they are or, or take care of themselves. But it also, unfortunately, even though it, it, it doesn't have the same um, volume impact to older adults, it unfortunately does cause deaths in older adults as well. Um, I'll try to pull the, the deaths number um, for you from the state, though. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you for that. And then... Um... In terms of best practices uh, that your average Montgomery County resident can utilize uh, in, a, in a practical sense, um, what can one do beyond you know, washing their hands, uh, not going to uh, the Bruce Springsteen concert tour uh, to prevent contracting RSV COVID, uh, becoming part of this uh, trifecta? Well, I think you mentioned two of the, the very um, common things that you can do in order to prevent yourself from uh, getting an upper respiratory tract infection, whether it's RSV, flu, or COVID. Um, these, all three of these can be transmitted by aerosol and RSV and flu can be transmitted by contact. Washing your hands, uh, using discretion when you go out into larger groups of people. Uh, for RSV and flu, you know, wiping down surfaces when anyone that you know has been exposed to those areas. Um, if you've been exposed to someone or you've been exposed and you think you have RSV and flu, you know, please stay home, uh, mask, um, you know, uh, and, and just all the, um, the common day-to-day -day things to prevent yourself from you know, either being exposed to it or exposing other people to it. And if you think you've been exposed, you know, um, please make sure that you monitor your signs and symptoms. And if you have become uh, impacted by either one of those three, um, 
please reach out to your primary care or your pediatrician if you need it. And if the symptoms progress and you have concerns, you can go to urgent care. And if there are severe symptoms, um, please come to the emergency department. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, up next yep. is Heather Curtis, WMAL. Also questions for Dr. Stoddard and Dr. Damiano. Good afternoon, Hello, Heather. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for uh, giving us this opportunity. I'm wondering, you know, given all of this increase in the tridemic, um, how concerned are you, Dr. Damiano, and also Dr. Stoddard, um, that the ERs may be overrun? I mean, it's a concern. I mean, anytime you have a outbreak like um, RSV or flu, um, even prior to COVID, those numbers of the numbers of patients that you see in the emergency department spike during the late fall, winter, and early springtime. And we put uh, processes and contingencies in place in order to handle those additional volumes. During the COVID pandemic, we created surge plans uh, that allowed us to see larger numbers of patients in different ways, uh, including using alternate uh, care, um, sites of care. Uh, to screen patients. Um, we increased our, our ability to see patients in the emergency department because of high volumes. And then in Holy Cross in Silver Spring, we took two uh, floors that were previously decommissioned. We uh, reopened those floors and we increased the number of beds. So we have contingency plans and we have surge plans in order for us to manage those increased volumes uh, that we're seeing. We're not at the point right now, the triple demic, where we have to go into a full blown surge plan like we did during the earlier portion of the COVID pandemic and during uh, the Omicron pandemic, but we're ready and stand by um, to do that as we monitor the number of patients we see. The only thing I add is this is definitely a national issue. I know that the uh, American College of Emergency Physicians did send a letter to the White House uh, uh, encouraging them to look more closely at this uh, ED volume and ED boarding issue, uh, you know, related to what we're seeing with this, uh, these multi-wave pandemic. Um, I think the, the big thing is, as Dr. Damiano alluded to, is there are processes that, that are, there, there are stages that are built in to allow patients to still have an opportunity to go to a hospital. That's an important thing, and, and there are layers to this. But what often does happen is you start to see shifts in the way care is delivered that can mean the care is delivered in an optimal way when the ED is operating in a healthy, reasonable capacity with volume. But you have to start making decisions that, um, that change the way care is delivered either locationally or by the ratio of nurses to patients or, or physicians to patients. And those do have consequences in terms of, uh, of, of potential outcomes. And I think that the key is that the goal of having this conversation with the public and in this way is to have people understand that we're not necessarily at the breaking point yet, but you don't want to get at the breaking point before you make the interventions. And that's the key here. And so we're talking about people making decisions, uh, making, making sure they're getting vaccinated, making sure that they're testing before they go and, you know, expose others, uh, trying to, you know, identify where they'll go and, and seek care when they need it uh, versus simply planning to rely on the emergency departments to be there to solve the problem for them on the back end. And so this is us trying to be a bit more proactive in our conversation with the public. And so I think that's a, that's a big thing why we're having this conversation. It could get it could get to the point where the EDs are really pressured and have to make some really tough decisions over the course of the next several months as we get through this next stage of holidays. As, as you recall, the, the, the early weeks of January with the original Omicron surge were very difficult in Montgomery County. And obviously we're trying to trying to be ahead of that as we get ready for these Christmas holidays. And the only piece I, I would like to add, uh, Heather, is that we continue to talk to not only our county hospital partners, but our regional partners as well, because we know that we've received patients outside of the county and some patients may be transferred out the, outside of the county. So the, the challenge impacts the entire community. And so I just wanted to share that in this form because it's, it, it's, it, it's a larger piece that we continue to provide and have discussions and dialogue with to make sure that no system is stressed because we want to make sure our, 
our county, uh, our county is our safe and healthy. And Dr. Damiano, I have one more question, uh, if I may. Um, you know, I heard from somebody in New York that she, her baby had RSV and she had to wait in the ER probably a day, a day and a half before she was able to, before they had a bed that they could admit her baby to do. Um, are we seeing here people having to wait in the ER, even though they know they're needing to be admitted, are we seeing people have to wait there because there just aren't beds? So I, you know, to answer your question, Dr. Stoddard talked about boarding. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, both Holy Cross Hospital and Holy Cross Germantown Hospital do not have pediatric ICUs. I don't know the particulars of the patient that you're referring to, but um, sometimes when we have to transport patients to hospitals that have pediatric ICUs, we have to wait for an availability of a bed in that pediatric ICU in that hospital prior to transferring, transferring that patient. While the patient is at Silver Spring or at Holy Cross Germantown Hospital, they're being cared for by our pediatricians and nurses in the emergency department uh, prior to the transport. So um, again, I don't know the specifics of the case you're referring to, but because of the RSV surge, as I mentioned earlier, our pediatric hospitals in the state and children's hospital, uh, they have had their capacity exceeded. Um, and sometimes there are delays in transporting patients from other community hospitals into those specialty hospitals with the pediatric ICUs. In that case, would you recommend that people who have, you know, children um, check, you know, figure out where the closest hospital with a pediatric ICU is and maybe go there instead? Would that be a, an easier option for them and for you and for the other hospitals? Well, I think there's a gradation of things uh, to do. And if the child is extremely sick um, and their pediatrician has had an opportunity to evaluate them and kind of discuss the plan of care with the patient, and they believe that you know the patient is an extremis, um, certainly I would go to the nearest um, emergency department to be evaluated and seen. If they have an option of going to a pediatric hospital with a pediatric ICU, um, and, and they believe that the child will wind up in the ICU, I think that's a, a, a certainly a consideration and a plan of action for those parents. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Heather. Up next, Kate Ryan, WTOP. Good afternoon, Kate. Hey, good afternoon. And I apologize, I am late here, uh, but I wanted to ask Dr. Damiano, again, knowing that we have three different viruses staring us in the face, is the threat that we're seeing now of, of the stress on hospitals a result of the three coming at once because of, of this season and their natural, you know, the fact that we see these in fall and uh, winter go up, or is it any one of these viruses more dangerous than the other right now, if I can put it that way? So I think to answer your question about the threat, uh, the threat and the risk to the emergency departments is the sheer number of patients that are coming in. As I mentioned earlier, we've seen a shift over the last couple of months from patients coming in with primarily uh, upper respiratory tract infections due to COVID. And in the last couple of months, we've seen a big spike in the number of patients coming in with RSV and flu. They, they appear to be occurring earlier than they have in previous years. Um, so our major concern right now is seeing an increased number of patients from RSV and flu while the COVID pandemic is still continuing, but at a much lower rate. Got it. And then in terms of hospitals that can accommodate the youngest, you said pediatric ICUs. How many do we have in the county? And I don't know if this is a question for you or Dr. Stoddard, but how, ma how many of those, just so people can level set their expectations when they go to an emergency room? So Holy Cross Hospital and Holy Cross Germantown Hospital do not have pediatric ICUs. We do have neonatal ICUs uh, to take care of our large number of patients uh, that we deliver. Um, we're one of the largest NICUs in the area, but we do not have a pediatric ICU. So a NICU takes care of newborns um, primarily just after delivery. So the, the nearest uh, pediatric ICU to us is uh, Children's National Medical Center. 
Okay, understood. And and um, this could go to either the doctor or uh, Mr. Elridge or Mr. Stoddard in terms of no one wants to see mask requirements come back. But I, I'm seeing it in several areas where uh, my doctor's office, for example, I was just there yesterday, requiring that we mask up before going on. I'm seeing um, some bus lines, not all of them, uh, asking people to please mask up. What What is your sense and what is your thought on best practices right now, given what we're seeing? I was going to... Mark, do you want to you want to say anything first, or I'm sure Dr. Bridges could arrive. <laughs> Look, I'll I'll be blunt because I usually am. Uh, I don't see the need for masking everywhere right now, but we have to look at where these numbers go and how the cases go. Um, I don't. I, I was actually going to say, I actually appreciated all the questions you're asking today. Um, because we rely on you all for getting information out to the community. We can do but so much. And I'm hoping that the comments from Dr. Damiano and from our own health people reinforce this notion that, yeah, we can, we're managing it right now, but we also, you know, could be in a situation where we don't manage it so well, it gets too widespread, and we're going to need to do something different. I'm not a, you know, I'm not anxiously, eagerly waiting to go back to masks, but I feel that. If that's what it were to take to knock down the spread of COVID enough that we can keep our hospitals open or functioning, I would hope that everybody would say, let's do this for the length of time we need to do it. And it doesn't mean we have to shut things down. This to me is the safest thing you can do and maintain otherwise normalcy in our lives. And so if we get there, we get there. And if we don't get there, great. But the decision has got to be made based on medical data and the, the ability to maintain the integrity of the health system. So just to add, uh, Kate, to um, what Mr. Elrich uh, just uh, stated, uh, right now, currently, in many spaces, individual mask wearing is the choice. However, the CDC and all the medical professionals and Dr. Damiano uh, uh, will sub in, sec second this, is that in any clinical setting, in any in any environment where there is higher transmission rate or likelihood to transmit a respiratory illness, mask wearing continues to be the most effective preventative measure that we have in a public health space or in health space. We see the numbers, and Dr. Damiano said this as well, that RSV and influenza or, or influenza-like illnesses um, are driving the numbers in the hospital system. COVID, we've seen wavelets, we've seen increases, but we have uh, resources. And so we need to continue to uh, educate the community regarding the uh, efficacy of mask wearing. Uh, it's an individual choice as I, I previously stated, but we aren't in that space yet, but the recommendation will come from our public health team. And when our health officer comes on board, that if we need to get to that point to suppress the spread and mitigate any increased cases, we are prepared to make that recommendation. It's not a recommendation yet, but we continue to monitor it. We need to keep the community safe. Got it. And last question, I promise. An impact on the schools in terms of attendance. Are you guys hearing from the school system on, on what impact this, again, particularly flu and RSV is having? Now, we've had conversations with Dr. Kapuna and our medical team uh, with MCPS, and we haven't seen any significant impact. We continue to monitor any outbreaks uh, in the school settings and in our child care settings. And so we haven't seen the those levels of absenteeism. We saw some early on in the in September as school began with the increase in RSV, but we haven't seen them yet or had the uh, uh, outbreaks uh, that we saw going into um, the winter months last year. I would say that the county did county and school system did meet today at 12 o'clock to discuss just, you know, being on the same page with testing and things of that nature to understand where things are at. So there are, are continued conversations and communications that are being had on a regular basis to, to collaborate. Yes. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Last question for Dr. Damiano. Is it D-A-M-I-A-N-O or D-O-M-I-A-N-O? D-A-M-I-A-N-O. Thank you so much. Am I, am I saying it right as well, Damiano? Yes, correct. Thank you.
Thank you, Kate. Uh, members of the media, any more questions for Dr. Damiano? Once, going twice. All righty then, well, I'll transition to other topics. And Dr. Damiano, if you can remain a little longer, just in case there are any lingering questions for you toward the end. Um, Mr. County Executive, let's move forward with uh, other topics. Yeah. So th thank you, Dr. Damiano, for joining us. And I, I hope the message of what you're facing at the hospitals and how the public can help assist uh, gets some coverage right now. Um, I will say, you know, the, the residents of Montgomery County responded really well during the worst of the pandemic. And so asking people to do, you know, more to make sure that we can keep things as open and uh, and normal as possible, I think, is in keeping with what we've done in the past. So hopefully folks will realize it really would be helpful if you get your flu shots and your uh, and your booster vaccination. Um, we really, we need your help because if, you know, if the hospitals goes down, it's gonna have unintended consequences for people if uh, they get backed up and can't provide the services they need. So keep that in mind. Um, I want to talk a little bit about an incident in Montgomery County. Uh, Montgomery County police are currently investigating a case of burglary and vandalism at Scotland AME, which is a historically black church in Potomac. And it happened in late November, but new video showed the sus suspected vandals has just been shared by the MCPD. It saddens me to see our community plagued by more racist and hate-filled vandalism, especially acting to target churches. Uh, my thoughts are with Pastor Dr. Evelina Huggins and all members of Scott and AME during this difficult time of fear and uncertainty. And we want them to know that this entire county stands with them and condemns these actions. Uh, throughout our nation's history, Black churches have been a refuge and safe space to stay safe in, in a climate of racism, hate, prejudice, and injustices. Black churches were at the epicenter of the civil rights movement. They continue to be targets of hate, violence, and intimidation. Uh, it's a shame that despite our efforts to make our country more inclusive, there's still those who hate so much that they'll desecrate a church um, just to make a point. And the Scotland Amy Church is a historic landmark in this county. And we take a, an attack on a house of worship or people in our community as an attack on all of us. Hate has no place here. We're gonna to continue to work with the interfaith and nonprofit communities to ensure that their members, congregants, and property are safe and secure. Um, just a few months ago, we cleared the way for $800,000 in grant money to be used by organizations like churches for security improvements. The money can be used in a variety of ways from adding to security measures to paying for security training. And the point was to give groups and organizations that could be targets of hate crime further um, an extra layer of defense. Uh, the money they, that can be used to purchase security, I was going to say this money can also be used to purchase security cameras and giving police a better chance of catching those responsible. And I'm glad to hear that Scotland AME did apply for this grant and the security camera that was purchased with the money was the same one that caught these vandals on camera. In this case, a reward of up to $10,000 is being offered for information that leads to arrest, I'd encourage everyone who needs to utilize our non-emergency phone number to report any bias or hate crime incidents, please. And that number is 301-279-8000. I'm gonna turn now to a COVID update. As we mentioned earlier, the rise in COVID cases is contributing to a hospital surge. And we've seen our cases jump per 100,000. Uh, we had been averaging around 80 cases. Now we sit at about 130 cases per 100,000. And that rate could continue to rise as we approach January. Our best defense is to stay up to date on boosters and get a flu shot. So far, only 31% of Montgomery County residents has received the flu shot, and only 27% have got the updated COVID booster. Uh, you don't need to get all the boosters you might have missed in between, but you need to get this one. Um, we have a children's flu clinic happening right now at Dennis Avenue Health Center in Silver Spring that goes until 4 p.m. today. And next Saturday on December 17th, we're going to have a combined flu shot and boosterama event at Wheaton Westfield Mall from 10 to 1 p.m. And I want to thank the folks at Wheaton Westfield 
uh, for continuing to support our efforts here. This is our fourth Boost Rama event in the past year. We've given out hundreds of shots to shoppers and those who want easy access to vaccines and I'm very happy that we're adding flu shots as well. We held our first Boost Rama during this busy shopping day last year, Omicron had just started. We literally had a long line and had to go back and get more shots than we had allocated. We'd love to see that happen again uh, next weekend. And I hope that the media will help us promote this event again as they have in the past. As Dr. Damiano explained, our hospitals need our help and getting vaccinated, boosted and getting the flu shot is critically important to getting them that help. Finally, as you begin to make your plans for the holidays, one of the most important things you can do is to take preventative measures for gatherings with your families and friends. Remember, these are your families and friends. Get tested before and after you attend gatherings. Take your face mask and routinely wash and sanitize your hands. And if you're not feeling well and you don't know that it's what the cause of it is, maybe you should stay away from people who aren't sick because if you don't know whether it's COVID, if you haven't gotten tested, you could be walking into a situation where you could easily put other people at risk. Uh, let's help protect everybody and our healthcare workers and included. And let's have a better holiday season and winter than last year. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Bridger and Sean O'Donnell and Dr. Started now to get a sense of what our health experts see in the latest data. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions later. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Sean. I have no additional comments, but um, as always available for any questions from the media. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, you should be able to see our, our pulse report and I'll, I'll try to go through these quickly. I do think um, I may have some answers for some of the questions that were already formed. And um, it, it is very nice uh, to have representation from our, our hospital partners here, um, because it, it really does confirm a lot of the things we've been, we've been looking at. Um, with one of the, just to add on, one of the questions is how is public health trying to assist hospitals? Uh, I'd just like to expand and say, one of our, our largest objectives is to try to keep people healthy enough that they don't need additional health care. They don't need to go to hospitals um, or warn them about risks to their health so that uh, again, they can protect themselves and, and try to avoid um, worse health outcomes. Uh, we've already talked about the impacts to our hospitals. Um, you can see from the lower left, these are just emergency department visits. Uh, so it does not uh, um, tell you really how many of those uh, turn into inpatient stays or, or transports that turn into inpatient stays. Um, but it does show that the high level of visits that Dr. Damiano mentioned going back to August, um, and then going down a little bit and then coming back up most recently. So we're already seeing um, high levels of visits, impacts to our hospitals from uh, uh, the bottom left is all reasons that people might visit an emergency department. The other charts on this page are showing uh, the specifically um, illnesses that have a temperature and uh, have uh, respiratory illness associated with them. Um, so that really captures a lot of the RSV, the flu, and, and obviously COVID. Um, you can see, as we've mentioned before, we saw earlier uh, the rates rising in our younger populations. A lot of that was driven by RSV earlier. Um, and now with influenza and COVID uh, levels going up, you see uh, some of the other age groups are being more impacted as well. Uh, one thing we just want to reiterate, we shared this a few months back, uh, There, this is the CDC uh, kind of charts out what they would consider an epidemic threshold. You see the seasonal wave down there that shows when you get into the winter or influenza season, as we've called it in the past, those, those rates of, of mortality associated with pneumonia and influenza go up. And then tr traditionally during the summer times, they go back down. And so there's a seasonal aspect to it. Obviously, when COVID came in, it has significantly impacted this. And this is something we just want to re reiterate to people. COVID is still causing a lot of increase in, in deaths um, uh, related to respiratory disease. Uh, you can, and additionally, 
we don't really have that valley during the off season that we've had um, when COVID was not part of it. Uh, you see that um, whether it was Delta last year or this past summer with um, BA four and five, uh, we've we've had an, a, a wave that cur- occurs during the non-influenza season. Um, and so the one that's happened this past year is a lower a lower um, uh, threshold for for mortality, even though it's it's above what we normally see, um, but it's lower than what we've seen in previous seasons. I'm hoping that uh, uh, that our residents continue to take precautions, all the things we've recommended earlier on the call, and try to keep this next wave as as low as possible as far as hospitalizations and deaths. Um, again, as our county executive mentioned, I've, during the call is just updating our our dashboard is, is updating. You see the numbers keep going up, both in hospital uh, percentage of patients in hospitals, total number of patients, new patients going with COVID, and then our, our overall um, rate of transmissions. Uh, what's driving this right now is the BA uh, 1.1 and the BA1. Um, those were related to BA5, they're being tracked separately. Um, it does look like from, from some of the scientific reports, the reason that's spreading is it they may be a little bit better at evading the immunity that people have had previously. Um, again, all the more reason to get a booster shot to help increase that immunity level. Um, and even if you still get sick, hopefully limit the consequences of that illness. Uh, again, we, we're reporting our hospital numbers, but I won't go into depth with this because we've already had um, excellent information shared by our colleagues. Uh, the updated death numbers, um, unfortunately, again, we did see uh, November's numbers go back up to almost a, a death per day. Um, and uh, in December's already, we're starting to see a mortality related to the increase in numbers. Um, so again, this it should be providing the picture that uh, we are not really out of the woods with the impacts that COVID can have on um, on our population. Uh, one thing we've stressed before, if you look at the, the right-hand side, you see the death rates by boosted um, have remained remarkably low. Um, those who are fully vaccinated are also low um, compared to the unvaccinated, but not as low as those who are boosted. Uh, as we've shared earlier, um, more than half of our 65 plus population who are eligible have gotten a bivalent booster. Um, unfortunately, that number drops to 35% um, of the county residents when you when you move that age down to 50 plus. And when you look at all uh, county residents who are eligible, it's down to uh, about 21, 22%. So we have a long ways to go before uh, before our, our county is as vaccinated as we, we have been in the past. Looking at RSV, um, as uh, has been shared a little bit earlier, we are seeing um, the test positivity come down um, uh, in Maryland for, for RSV. We've also seen the hospitalizations associated with RSV start to come down. Um, unfortunately, that has been paired with uh, with a rise in influenza, as Dr. Damiano shared. Um, not unique to uh, to Maryland or to Montgomery County, um, but over the the previous the previous week has more than doubled the um, the hospital admissions from flu from the week prior to it. Uh, so we're we're seeing a really large increase in influenza activity. Um, the recommendations for influenza are very similar for COVID uh, in annual vaccination. Um, everyone six and older or six months and older can get a flu vaccine. Um, antiviral treatment for those at greater risk for, um, for serious illness from flu. Uh, and just like COVID, they need to be started as soon as possible. Um, the good news is all the viruses they've evaluated so far this season have been susceptible to those antivirals. The antivirals work on them. So again, if you do get uh, um, if you do get ill, please get tested to figure out if it's COVID, maybe if it's influenza, particularly if you are at risk for severe outcomes, because you can receive a treatment that can um, dramatically reduce the likelihood of hospitalization or death. Uh, as as for how much influenza, you can see on the right, um, we're now up to 
uh, more than 30,000 uh, positive tests, um, as opposed to last year when the peaks were closer to 7,000 uh, a week. So we're, we're significantly higher. Again, last year and the years before, we're much lower than normal rates of influenza. Um, so we're, we're seeing, you know, a higher, higher levels this year. Uh, was asked why we might be seeing more RSV or more influenza. Um, when you look at, at this table of the previous years, that, that large red um, line is pre-COVID. Uh, and then you have blue, which is the first year of COVID with the most restrictions that, uh, people engaged in, uh, staying home from work. Um, a lot, there are lots of closures, lots of masking. Um, and again, no real difference in vaccination availability, um, but you see very low levels of influenza that first year. And then last year, um, again, just hospitalizations alone, uh, you see they, they went up a little bit, but there was still lots of masking going on and lots of people being you know, taking precautions. Um, and so, you know, it is a consideration, uh, as Dr. Bridgers mentioned, how how uh, much are people engaging in these precautions this year? And is that why we're seeing some increases in um, some of this spread? Uh, there are also, you know, different strains of influenza we're looking at um, from year to year. But that certainly uh, there's there's very interesting evidence in the hospitalizations from previous years. Uh, I just added this in. I know there's a question about deaths related to influenza and related to RSV. Um, Maryland has identified five deaths so far um, from related to influenza. I don't know if their surveillance includes pneumonia deaths. Often pneumonia and influenza deaths are combined uh, for reporting. Um, it's also can be difficult and there can be a lag in identifying these. So I just ask you to take this with a little bit of caution. Um, these numbers could certainly be a bit higher, uh, but that's to date. And you see that all five of them have been in the last um, three weeks. Uh, I have not been able to find published uh, RSV deaths um, for the state of Maryland, but I can share nationally, uh, there's usually between 6,000 and 10,000 deaths uh, a year across the country, um, just in 65 and older populations, and another 100 to 300 deaths in under five uh, populations. Um, so, that, that is what the historical average has been. I don't yet have data on um, what we're seeing in Maryland this year. Uh, we've already, uh, um, I think the county executive has mentioned that our, our flu vaccination, our, our annual vaccination rate is around 30%. Um, and while that's one of the higher ones in the, the state, it's still lower than where we've been in previous years. And then finally, just to close out with monkeypox, again, this is another week where the county has not um, identified any new cases. Uh, the state did report two new cases across the state. So um, again, we're still vaccinating and um, maintaining surveillance on uh, monkeypox. And I just finally want to add, we do have surveillance on our uh, wastewater sites. It is on our website for public uh, consumption. Um, we have seen some increases in um, uh, COVID samples at the wastewater sites as well. Um, but again, it's just part of all of these surveillance tools that we're, we're using and we share with you all. Um, Dr. Stoddard, is there anything you'd like to add or Dr. Bridgers? No, I'm good for questions. No, thank you, Mr. O'Donnell for the presentation. Uh, members of the media, let's open it up now for questions and answers with uh, the officials. Please use the chat. And uh, we'll wait a second or two. Any questions? Heather Curtis, you're back. WMAL, good afternoon again. Good afternoon again. I have a question for uh, the county executive. Um, Mr. County Executive, um, I'm sure you heard that this morning there were more migrants dropped off in front of the vice president's house. And I heard that there were, as, as always, you know, Montgomery County nonprofits were stepping up to help mm -hmm. with that. Um, and I know that you recently approved the extra appropriation to um, 
help those migrants. I'm wondering if any of that money is able to be used mm-hmm. now. And um, if you think that that, I believe it was 1.7 million, is going to be enough given that these drop-offs continue to happen and Montgomery County is really stepping up to the plate helping. I, I cannot say what it's, what's going to be enough because I don't know how far the governors are going to go in continuing this farce. Um, but, we, you know, we're going to deal with it. Hopefully we'll get some federal support for this as well. Um, as for, far as what's available this moment, I'm not sure on the status of distribution. Maybe Dr. Stoddard could help me on that one. Yeah, we had a meeting yesterday actually with the team to talk about it and, and the work of uh, work at the county's respite center on, largely being done by the International Relief Agency, SAMU, uh, continues and, and the plan is to continue for um, uh, for at least, you know, until we get a better handle on what these states are likely to do. Obviously, with a change in the governor's mansion in the state of Arizona, I would anticipate that uh, Governor-elect Hobbs will likely have a different posture towards this program uh, in, in, in Arizona than had been had under now Governor Ducey. And so I would expect that we would see a change there. And I think that what we see now in Texas is, is they have um, diversified their portfolio of cities that are receiving uh, buses of, uh, of individuals. And so obviously we don't know necessarily what that will mean for us long term, but um, the county, Montgomery County has always been a very welcoming place. The county executive, the county council have always been very supportive of the idea that uh, we are enriched by having uh, new residents come. And obviously, uh, our economy has benefited from having additional workers and, and, and people to, to uh, um, support jobs uh, across the county. And so, obviously, we've embraced that and, and have, uh, you know, will continue to do so. Uh, with the, res- the, res- the resources that were provided by the council are really a just continuation of, of things that we were already doing. So they will be seamlessly integrated into the services that we're already providing. And there are, there's been continuity since the beginning. And as you alluded to, uh, Montgomery County has been really on the forefront regionally uh, uh, in, in, in engaging with this, uh, engaging with these uh, newly arrived uh, newcomers and we'll continue to do so. Dr. Satter, do you know how many who arrived today may have been brought to the county for help and maybe staying at that respite center? I don't know because I do, the, the respite center obviously has been operating at capacity more or less, and, and it's, a, it's meant to be a 72-hour stay. So it really just comes down to how many vacancies of people moving out versus how many people were coming in. So I, I can't, I, I could probably find that out, but it would be largely based on how many people who were leaving for their final destination today, and therefore how many could we possibly receive. So I, it, we, we've been averaging right around 50 uh, or so that, that stay, um, but obviously it's, it's meant to be in for a few days, uh, get you, get you a, a meal and some showers and clean your clothes and, and help you with uh, your, you know, your travel accommodations to get you on to wherever it is that these residents or these these individuals want to end up. And just a quick question for clarification. When you say there are about 50 that stay, is that in the respite shelter each night? Yes. Got it. And do you know if any of the smaller nonprofits have applied for some of the $200,000 in grant money yet? I don't think they have yet, but again, uh, that was continuation money. So they have funds that have been made available by the county to do the work up until now. And that money was largely identified as a, as a, as a, as a future need over the next several months. And so our, our community nonprofits have really been engaged with, the numbers change a little bit. We've been using roughly 15% of the individuals who come in through this program that, that Texas and Arizona have, have put forward. We're only about 15% or so. It varies. Sometimes it's a bit higher and it has been slightly increasing over time. Uh, only about 15% stay in the region, not all in Montgomery County, obviously. And so um, the, the community nonprofits really play a huge role transitioning people out of the respite center who wish to stay in Montgomery County, get them set up with housing, an opportunity for work and some basic accommodations to get them get them on their feet. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. Up next, Kate Ryan, WTOP. Kate. Thank you. I just wanted to double check on the when we were talking earlier about the flu and the number of people vaccinated in the county now is in the 30 percent range. Do I have that right? 
How much lower is that or higher than in, say, last year or the year before? I, um, I have to go back and, and try to find the data for the for this point in time, um, but I know that uh, we have been receiving reports from the state that overall that it's there's been a lag um, from the same point in time of the previous year. Uh, so I, I can't tell you the exact number at the moment. Gotcha. But again, the number right now where we are is 30 what percent? That's correct. Thir I'm sorry, 31? Okay. Yes. And do we have a breakdown in ages? Because I know that the message traditionally has always been to, to be with, uh, you know, the very young or folks who are older. Are, are those folks who are older who are used to being told, yeah, I should go and get mine and tend to, are, are those making up the largest group that is getting vaccinated? Let me share it. I'll share it with you. Again, this is um, all available on the um the state dashboard page, you do, there's a, when you get there, there's a series of tabs in the middle of the page. You can scroll through and the, the last two share the vaccination numbers for influenza. Um, so it takes a, it, it takes a little while to navigate to it, but um, this is where it's showing 31.3% for Montgomery County. And on the right, um, that's statewide um, vaccination administered by age group. And so you can see there uh, again, the the largest number is in those those older populations. Even though they make up again, these aren't vaccination rates; these are total vaccinations. And so the the rates would be even higher. Um, but uh, that should give you some idea of who's coming out to get the to get the influenza vaccine. Right, and pardon me, but I am trying to get you to say it because my listeners can't see this. <laughs> so, 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 so yes, the the highest rates are the uh, 50 and older populations um, coming out to get their uh, influenza uh, vaccine. And a lot of that I think is being recommended by their visit to their primary care physician who should be reminding them to get their flu shot. And in some cases, depending on their age, they may also be getting their pneumococcal shot as well. Um, but again, I think that is um, hopefully what is helping to drive this. Gotcha. And and I'm seeing again, those uh, 10, 10 to 19 and 20 to 29 are on the lower end, particularly 20 to 29 uh, ages are on the lower end of uh, uh, getting their flu vaccines. Are, are they, I think that that's a group that has gone in the past, well, I'm really not vulnerable to this. The message is different now because of all that we're seeing with, with all the uh, viruses out there. You know, that that is like, you know, these are age groups that typically don't have the, the same sorts of severe outcomes. Uh, unless they have underlying conditions, they often don't have the same sorts of severe outcomes that older populations may have. Um, however, you know, there, I think as we've seen for the past few years with COVID, and we've, I think we've always known this, um, even if you don't get severely ill yourself, you can be somebody spreading it to other members of your family or people you work with or other folks. Um, and, you know, I, I can say I'd much rather have a two day illness or a three day illness than something that is much more severe, even if it doesn't send me to the hospital. So um, I, I think getting a flu shot is common sense. Um, and it's certainly recommended again by our federal public health partners, state and local health departments. Everyone six months and six months and older should um, get that flu shot unless their doctor is telling them there's a reason that they shouldn't. But, um, you know, uh, we'd, we'd like to see all those numbers go up. Terrific. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I, I understood that properly. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kate. Up next, Jeannie Vexby, but less to beat. Good afternoon, Jenny. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, kind of switching gears from the health update, but I do have a question for Mr. Elrich. Um, you supported these bills coming forward from Senator Kramer that would impact how local yeah. government bodies are interacting with the planning board. And yesterday, um, I know you've spoken on this, but yet yesterday, some former planning officials came out with a letter, really, they did not mince words, saying that this is overreach and they're claiming this would strip the Council of Land Use Powers and give them to the county executive office. I just wanted to kind of give you a chance to respond. What, yeah. what are kind of your thoughts on their position on this and what would you say? So I'd say, first of all, their letter was stunningly dishonest. 
Um, the, the process for the planning board has changed multiple times. And some of the players on that letter know that perfectly well because they've been involved in land use and planning. So how the, how the planning board is chosen and who chooses who on the planning board has changed multiple times in the last 40 years. Um, so this is, this is not surprisingly. The other thing is the, the bigger bill, which is um, the one that we create a study. We don't, um, we're not proposing any outcome of the study. I mean, the, the thing is that, you know, we, we have major problem in this county with planning and permitting. And we know this. And in fact, everybody likes to talk about it until you talk about trying to propose a solution to it. And then it's, oh, no, we don't want to change everything. We have the best system. No, we do not. And if you talk to the developers in the community, they'll tell you the same thing. And what we're trying to do is look at what we can do structurally with park and planning and some of the process they have there that will enable us to more quickly and more efficiently process applications. None of that has anything to do with shifting quote unquote power to the executive branch. Even in the bill, the second bill where there's, a, there's an appointment issue, they, uh, Senator Kramer's bill would give the executive the appointment of one person out of five on the planning board, hardly a power grab. But I do think there's a role for the executive in this since executive our offices have to administer a lot of the things that come out of the planning board. So they're, they're creating basically entirely false narrative. We're not interested in any power grab or shifting massive powers to the executive branch. We're trying to do what developers have actually asked us to do and something I totally agree with. Our processes do not work. They are, they are slow and they make things more expensive and we can do better. And that's all this is about. Everything else is in their imagination. All right, thanks, Mark. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, members of the media, any more questions? I do not see any more on the chat. Going once, going twice. I guess we're done for today. Thank you, Dr. Damiano for joining us this afternoon. Thank you officials and thank you for participating. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Be safe. We'll Thank see you, you next all. time.